Starlight, written by Mark Miller and art by Goran Parlov. Hello everyone. In this video, I will be covering Starlight by Mark Miller. Last week, I covered Nemesis by Mark Miller, and that was honestly a pretty mixed bag. Uh, that is probably one of the worst Mark Miller books, but I think Starlight is one of his best. I absolutely love Starlight. So what is Starlight about? It is about a space adventurer named Duke McQueen that 40 years ago traveled to another galaxy, another planet, and he saved this planet and was a hero. And he returned back to Earth, but no one believed his story. And then we jump ahead and he's an old man, and someone wants him to go back to that planet. Very fun story. This is Mark Miller not trying to be edgy, not being cringy. It is Mark Miller in that kind of wholesome territory, kind of like Superior, but it is a nice sci-fi romp and is very fun, and I think you will all enjoy it. This is also potentially going to be turned into a movie as well, and it would make a fantastic movie, so uh, I'm excited to see that whenever it comes out. Honestly, every Mark Miller book has some sort of movie deal or TV deal attached and is potentially going to be adapted. Even Nemesis has a potential movie adaptation coming out, but a Starlight movie would be great. Let's dive into the story for Starlight by Mark Miller and Goran Parlov, and I'm sure you will all dig it. Issue 1. The cover of this issue by artist John Cassidy shows Duke McQueen in his space outfit brandishing a sword, and the sword is splitting the page in half. On the left side, we see Duke McQueen as an old man in his 60s with gray hair. And on the right side, we see Duke as a younger man in his 20s. There is also a variant cover by Goran Parlov. It is Duke McQueen with the Princess Atala. And here is a, another variant. It is just showing us Duke McQueen with a white background. Duke McQueen, in his early 20s, was a test pilot working for the U.S. Air Force. He was a handsome, well-built man with dark hair. One day, he was flying, and he traveled through a wormhole that transported him to another part of the galaxy. And there, he had many space adventures. Here, we see him sword fighting a villain with an eye patch and sailing a boat on an alien world. And he gets out of the boat moments before it goes off of a waterfall. Here we see him riding a dragon. Eventually, on the planet Tantalus, Duke McQueen fought and saved the people there from the dictator known as Typhon. And then Duke got various medals put on him by a woman named Atala, a sexy princess with long blonde hair wearing a fancy bikini outfit with various patterns on it. Atala put the medals on Duke at a big ceremony, seen in person by tens of thousands on the planet, as well as seen on galactic cameras across the galaxy by millions. Duke McQueen was a legend, a hero on this planet, and his name was known all over. The Princess Atala ordered her people to remove the statue of the now-deposed dictator Typhon and erect one of Duke McQueen, their hero, to commemorate how he freed her people, how he saved billions of lives. Later on, after the celebrations have winded down and there was peace on the planet Tantalus, the princess asked Duke to stay and be her lover and they would rule the planet as king and queen. The wormhole, though, was going to be closing very soon, within the next 24 hours. And if Duke didn't leave then, he would be trapped on the planet Tantalus forever and would have no way to get back home. And Duke tells Atala that he must go home. But Atala asks him, would it really be so bad to stay here with her? Duke apologizes to Atala and tells her that he already has a girl back home. Atala says, but this is paradise now that you've deposed 
Python, and the Duke replies to her, It wouldn't be paradise without my Joanne. Joanne is his girlfriend from back home. So Duke McQueen traveled back home to Earth. We now jump ahead 40 years. Duke McQueen is 63 years old now. He has gray hair. His alarm clock goes off at 7 a.m. He turns it off and he smokes. He takes a shower and brushes his teeth. He puts on a suit and his now adult kids and his little grandkids come by and pick him up in a car. In the car, Duke's granddaughter, Becca, she tells her grandpa, I'm sorry about grandma. We see that Duke is at a funeral. His wife, Joanne McQueen, the one that he left Tantalus for all those many years ago, she is now dead. She died from breast cancer. They lived a happy life together, filled with love and children and grandchildren, but Joanne is gone now and life goes on. After the funeral, Duke's children, Larry and Ralph, discuss their dad amongst themselves. They both love their dad, Duke, but they see him as a little bit of a burden. Neither one wants to take him in to live with them. They have busy lives. Duke would just get in the way. But Larry says that maybe a retirement home would be best for Duke. Ralph, looking at his dad and how strong and virile he still is, says, Ah, you know what? He'll be fine for now. He's still got his wits. We just need to keep an eye on him. So Duke continued living his life without Joanne. He lived by himself and he got by, but he missed his wife. A year passed. The anniversary of his wife's death was approaching, and Duke was making dinner plans with his kids to commemorate the occasion. He's going to have them over for dinner, and he wants to make something special. Now, Duke is not really a cook, but he's making an effort. So Duke goes to the grocery store to pick up some items. At the grocery store, three little kids stop and talk to Duke. They seem to recognize him. The one child with glasses asks Duke, Are you the guy that thinks he flew his plane to another planet? My friends were telling me that you got sucked through a wormhole and came home telling everyone you'd met real aliens? Is that true or are they just messing with me? And Duke answers, Well, I'm not sure if it was a wormhole, but yeah, I ended up someplace else for a while and Saw some crazy stuff. I just don't like talking about it. And the kid asks him, Is it true they put a probe in Uranus? <laughs> and the kids then run away laughing. When Duke gets home, he makes his fancy dinner for his family. And he phones his kids to come over as they originally planned. But Larry and Ralph can't show up. They have to bail. Ralph, he got the dates mixed up and he had other plans that night. And Larry was busy at work. His dad phoned him, but Larry just ignores it. So Duke is sad he put in all this effort and made this dinner and his kids don't really appreciate it and don't show up. Duke understands his kids still love him, but they have other priorities and they don't have time for him anymore. Duke, he walks over to a wall in his home that has newspaper clippings of his exploits in space. Even his old costume and ray gun. We see from the newspaper clippings that Duke made the news a lot when he came home from space. But all of his stories of his various exploits in space were not believed. All the stuff about saving the planet Tantalus from the tyrant Typhon and saving billions of lives and all the medals he received and the sexy princess Atala. Everyone dismissed him as a crazy nut, and they think he was just making up stories. For what it's worth, though, his wife Joanne believed her husband and his stories, but no one else really did. Even Duke's kids, Ralph and Larry, dismissed their dad's claims. Duke, he was a legend, a savior. There are statues built of him on other planets. Across the galaxy, he was famous. But on Earth, he was just some guy that went to space and came back with a whole bunch of made-up stories no one believed. 
as Duke is drinking a beer, looking at his past glory, he hears a loud noise outside of his home. Duke, he rushes outside and sees there is a spaceship landing in his backyard. And Duke comments, You've got to be kidding me. Issue 2. The cover of this issue by Bill Senkowiz shows Duke McQueen with a little boy named Krish Moore, whom we will meet soon. The variant cover for this issue shows this Krish Moore standing on a spaceship with space in the background. Duke, looking in his backyard at this spaceship, soon sees a little kid named Krish Moore. Krish puts up his arms and says, Don't shoot! I'm only 86! Krish then corrects himself. On his home planet, he's 86. But on Earth, because the Earth is not as far away from the sun, he thinks he's around, oh, maybe 12 and a half years old here. Krish removes his helmet and reveals his pink hair. He shakes Duke's hand. Krish then introduces himself. He explains that he traveled halfway across the galaxy to be here, and it is an honor for him to meet such a great man as Duke McQueen. He's only ever seen Duke in history books before this. Duke, he thinks that maybe this is some kind of joke, but Krish explains that he needs Duke's help. Duke asks him, how is it even possible that he's here? He says, I don't get it. How could you fly from Tantalus? I thought the rift wasn't going to be open again for another 10,000 years. And Krish explains, oh, you don't need a wormhole to get here now. Advances in engineering mean every ship gets fitted with a warp drive as a standard feature. So technology has advanced, and now it's pretty easy to get from Tantalus to Earth for the Tantalonians. Duke asks, how come you guys don't come here all the time then? And Krish laughs and says, honestly, <laughs> there's not a lot to see here on Earth. Krish is surprised to see Duke's home and how he lives so modestly. He asks, how does the savior of his world not live in a big house with servants? And Duke explains how no one on Earth believed his story. Krish explains that he needs Duke's help. He says that when Duke left, his planet of Tantalus lived in relative peace, and they spent so many years civilized and in this peace that most of the people forgot how to fight. And eventually, a warrior race called the Broteans attacked Tantalus. The Broteans had been watching Tantalus for years from a nearby world. They were jealous of Tantalus's wealth and natural resources. Their leader was a man named King Fisher. This King Fisher launched such a ruthless, precise attack that the Broteans were able to dominate the planet of Tantalus in a single day. There is still a small resistance movement on planet Tantalus, but most of the planet has now been enslaved. This is why Krish wants Duke's help. Duke is trying to explain that he can't help, he's too old now. But Krish argues, You're the greatest hero our world has ever known, sir. If there's one man I'm sure we can rely on, it's the two-fisted pilot who saved us all before. And Duke tells Krish, You don't understand, son. Things are different now. It's not that I don't want to help, it's just I'm not the guy I was 40 years ago. If you're looking for a place to hide, you're more than welcome here, but I can't go flying around in rocket ships at my age. I know it's not what you wanted to hear, but at least you'll be safe from these lunatics you ran away from. Krish is disappointed that Duke will not help him. Krish is going to spend the night in Duke's home, and then he's going to head back in the morning once his spaceship recharges a bit. Krish goes inside Duke's house to sleep for the night. Duke... He stays outside and smokes a cigarette, and he stares up into the stars. Duke, he thinks to himself, this is a stupid idea. But he agrees to help Krish 
and return to planet Tantalus. The next morning, Duke, he tries on his old space outfit. It still fits him, although it's a little tight around his waist. And Duke, he packs his bags. And Krish and him head to the spaceship, and then they take off. Krish comments, Man, the people back home will lose their minds when they see who I've brought to save everyone. In the spaceship, Krish lets Duke fly it a bit, get a feel for it. Duke flying the ship goes for a little joyride. Eventually, some U.S. fighter jets pull up beside the spaceship. And they're asking Duke and Krish for their call signs and various information, and then they start threatening them. Duke, he figures it's time they leave, so he hits the hyperspace button, and the spaceship really starts moving through the galaxy. Duke asks Krish, This is amazing. What kind of speed are we even doing? And Krish explains, Oh, things like speed don't matter anymore, Captain. We're bending space around ourselves and building our own space warp to travel through. Duke looking out the window, seeing the galaxy going by. He thinks it's a beautiful sight. And he tells Krish, It's been 40 years since I saw the stars from up here and there's no more beautiful a sight. After a few minutes, they come out of warp and they are now above the planet Tantalus. Duke looks at the planet, and even though he was here 40 years ago, he is still in awe of the fact that he is here now. And Krish, he welcomes Duke back to Tantalus. Issue 3 The cover of this issue is by Francesco Francovilla, and we see Duke and Krish on what looks like an old sci-fi movie poster or cover to a pulp magazine or something. There's also a variant cover by Goran Parlov, where we see Duke and Krish walk on the planet's surface, which seems to have crystals protruding from the ground. On the planet Tantalus, we see the Brotian villain known as the Kingfisher that has taken over the planet. Kingfisher is talking about his castle he built, which has no doors. It is the castle with no doors. Kingfisher wears a green hood and he has a mask with these yellow horns sticking out on the side of it. Kingfisher is with one of his military leaders, a man named Admiral Pindar. Kingfisher tells his admiral, People ask why I built such a thing. I tell them, doors are a sign of weakness. Doors are for men who fear their enemies and all my enemies are dead. That sounds badass and all, but if you have a castle with no doors, then how do you get inside of it yourself? <laughs> I'm just saying, Kingfisher, think about it. There is a flying sphere camera recording all sorts of action going on. Kingfisher has a palace guard of the old regime, and he is asking this palace guard where the resistance is located. The palace guard tells Kingfisher to go to hell. Kingfisher, using these fancy, expensive telekinetic gloves that he bought, starts twisting the palace guard's body telekinetically. Kingfisher explains how he got these gloves to the now dying palace guard. Kingfisher says, I paid for this with a year's supply of your planet's most precious minerals. Think about that as you die, because that's what I'm spending your money on, a loyal soldier. Useless toys! The body of the now dead palace guard is then tossed into a pit down below. The pit is called the Pit of the Vanquished. Krish and Duke, they land on the planet surface. Krish is trying to bring Duke to meet the resistance. As they are walking through the streets, Krish tells Duke to keep his head down for now. As they are walking, Duke is surprised to see the old statue in his honor that was erected in the city square. It is huge and looks gold. The statue is of a young Duke McQueen immortalized high above the city, 
pointing his laser weapon. A sign on the statue reads, Erected with gratitude by the people of Tantalus. Krish explains, I used to pass this every morning on the way to school, and it always made me feel better, like we had a little hope. Do you, he feels a little embarrassed by it, like it's a joke in the middle of all this. Duke, you see some Brotian cops with batons beating up an innocent person. The police are actually mugging this man. Krish tells Duke to just ignore it, but Duke exclaims to hell with that. He tells the cops to leave the man alone. They're cops for crying out loud. They shouldn't be doing this. The cops ask Duke, who the hell is he? to tell a Brotian what to do. And Duke points to the giant statue of him behind him, and he says, who am I? That's who I am. The Brotian cop gets in Duke's face, and Duke knees him in the groin, and then shoots the other cops with a ray gun, which slices them in half. The crowd seeing this start reacting, and they say, oh my god! It's Duke McQueen! I don't believe it! The savior of Tantalus has come back to free us! More cops arrive, and Duke starts shooting at them and killing more of them. Him and Krish start running through the streets, running past sandy street stalls that look straight out of Aladdin. Duke, he gets tired, he pants, and then he gets run over by a red hover car and gets knocked out. When Duke wakes up, he is in a prison cell with Krish, and the two of them are scheduled to be executed very soon. So this is already not a very good start to their mission. In the prison holding cell, Duke and Krish meet a man named Wes Adams. Wes is dressed like the Fonz from Happy Days. He has a leather jacket and has his hair all gelled up. Wes, he shakes Duke's hand. He knows of Duke's exploits from history and is honored to meet Duke. Duke asks about Wes's odd attire. No one else on the planet dresses like this. Wes explains that he is a fan of alien styles and vintage memorabilia from Earth, and some Earth items have been coming to their planet recently and he has been collecting them. He's also been collecting things like Earth movies and magazines. Although, they often get stuff many years later after it's already been a thing on Earth. Wes, he's actually kind of curious about some celebrity gossip. He knows who Tom Cruise is, and he knows that Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman were married, and he's wondering how they're doing. He figures Duke's from Earth, and he might know. Tom and Nicole were actually married from 1991 to 2001. But Wes's info is actually a little behind, so he doesn't really know what happened after that. Before Duke can answer, though, we cut away to the castle with no doors. We see the castle palace looks very opulent, with plenty of scantily clad females around. We see some of the royalty in the castle is just chowing down on some food and living a very gluttonous lifestyle. Kingfisher talks with his Admiral Pindar about this Duke McQueen and how Duke will be executed tomorrow. And Kingfisher, he wants to make a publicity stunt out of this. It should help crush any other rebellions and crush the will of the people so they will be easier to rule. The news media on Tantalus is promoting the upcoming execution of Duke McQueen all over the news media on the planet. In a seedy bar on Tantalus, we see some of the resistance fighters that oppose this King Fisher. And they're watching the TV and they see Duke's arrest on the news. The leader of the resistance is a woman named Tilda Starr. She is a fit looking, serious woman with dark skin and she is nursing a beer. Tilda was previously the head of the royal bodyguard for the previous king and queen on Tantalus. Tilda's men ask her what the plan is, and she says confidently, I say we bust him out tonight. So they are planning on freeing Duke 
McQueen. Issue 4. On the cover by Travis Charest, we see a young Duke McQueen holding a sword. There is a variant cover by Pascal Ferry, and it shows Duke and Krish standing on the planet surface, and we see the skulls of various dead animals all around. And there is another variant cover, this one by Goran Parlov, and it shows Tilda Star with a white background behind her. Wes Adams is talking with Duke, and Duke is filling him in on Tom Cruise's love life post-Nicole Kidman. Tom was with Penelope Cruz for a bit, and then Katie Holmes from Dawson's Creek. Wes is kind of shocked by all this. <laughs> Eventually, Admiral Pindar comes to the jail cell to talk to them. Pindar asks Duke where the Resistance is located. Duke says he doesn't know anything, because he really doesn't know anything. He just arrived on the planet after all. Krish is looking at Admiral Pindar and he recognizes him. Pindar asks Krish, have we met before? Krish nervous says, no sir. Pindar is convinced that he has met this little boy before. He says that he never forgets a face. He feels like maybe he knows the boy's parents. He wants to question the boy further. Krish hides behind Duke, and Duke says to Pindar, you'll have to go through him first if he wants the boy. At that moment though, before things escalate some more, the wall in the prison room they are in explodes and tumbles down to the ground. The Resistance have come to save Duke McQueen and the others. Tilda Star, the head of the Resistance, gives them jetpacks and they fly away. Pindar and his men fire on them and pursue them in some flying vehicles, but it is of no use. The Resistance manages to escape. They use a teleporter that opens a portal and sends them to the planet's southern hemisphere. Once they do that, they are completely in the clear. Now we see this southern hemisphere they are all in now is a grassy, very beautiful area. Lush with trees as far as the eye can see. Christian Duke. They see the bodies of these huge dead giants littered throughout the forest. Tilda explains, the giants were wiped out the week of the invasion. Their entire tribe killed all for a few precious gems. That's why we've been hiding here. The bad guys think there's nothing left to plunder, and we literally couldn't be further away. Tilda then leads them into their hidden base, and we see the hidden base is filled with spaceships. It looks like it's something right out of Star Wars. Tilda explains that there is almost a hundred resistance fighters now. She also says, we know the civilians will never rise up, but if we plan this right and hit specific targets, I really believe we can take the capital back. Tilda looking at Duke now feels like their odds have improved. Tilda calls Duke a legend. A man comes over and gives Duke a sword, much like his old one he used to use. Duke, he thinks about his life and the responsibility placed on him now to come through for these people. And Duke, seeing a crowd of people forming around him, decides to try and say something motivational. He says, My wife always said I'd come back here, that my time on Tantalus wasn't over yet. She's the only one that ever believed in me. Even my sons thought I was nuts. It means a lot when people have little faith in you, especially when you're old and washed up. And then Duke, raising his sword, says, You have my word, I won't let you down. Later on, Duke is talking with Krish and sees that he is a little sad looking. He asks him what's the matter, and Krish, tearing up, explains that that Pindar guy that was questioning them earlier when they were locked up? He was the man that murdered his parents. Duke places his hands on Krish's back and consoles him. Elsewhere, 
we learn that Wes Adams, the guy that was dressed as the Fonz that met Duke and Krish in the prison holding cell, well, we learn that he is secretly working for King Fisher. And over an earpiece device, he tells King Fisher the location of the Resistance's base. And he tells King Fisher to send everything he's got to take them down. Issue 5. On the cover to this issue, drawn by Tommy Lee Edwards, we see King Fisher and Duke McQueen. There is also a variant cover, this one drawn by Rob Liefeld, and it shows Duke McQueen holding a gun and a sword. Some of you may or may not be familiar with Rob Liefeld's art, but one thing funny about him <laughs> is that he loves drawing a dude carrying a sword in one hand and a gun in another. I googled around and found four other drawings of various characters he has done like this. There's Deadpool, Deathstroke, Snake Eyes, and this Major X character, and I'm sure there are many more. Anyway, it amused me how much he is copying himself here. Krish is telling Duke the story of how his parents died. The Brotian royal family had a month-long party and one of the Kingfisher's cousins got high on drugs and crashed his hover car in the middle of a market, creating a huge accident. And Krish's dad was a surgeon, and he operated on Kingfisher's cousin for 18 hours. Even though he tried his hardest, he couldn't save the guy's life. And the Kingfisher family took a tough line on anyone who failed them. And Kingfisher sent Pindar to kill Krish's parents. Admiral Pindar was the man who pulled the trigger. When Krish's parents were gunned down by Pindar, Pindar's men asked him, what about the kid? Pindar answers, orders war just to take out the parents. The soldier asks, so what do we do with him? And Pindar answers, Just leave him. Let him do what every other orphan has to do. Learn how to bake. And Pindar throws some coins on the ground for Krish. Krish, on the ground over his parents' dead bodies, tells Pindar, I'm gonna get you for this. And Pindar asks, What? And Krish explains, I'm gonna get help, and I'm gonna come back, and then I'm gonna hunt you down. And Pindar to this says, oh, really? And who exactly do you plan to call? And Krish then, he looked up at the statue of Duke McQueen. It was shortly after that he stole a spaceship and headed to Earth to pick Duke up. Duke, hearing Krish's story of his parents' death, comforts him. Krish asks Duke, will you get him for me, Captain? And Duke answers, oh, I'm going to do better than that, son. I'm going to teach you how to get him yourself. Duke then sets up some cups and has Krish practice trying to shoot them. And eventually Krish's aim gets a little bit better and he does hit them. Later on, Duke is talking with Tilda Starr and they're discussing plans. Duke comments, I gotta say, this takes a little getting used to coming from a place where nobody believed in me to a world where everybody kinda does? Tilda asks him, do you like it? And Duke answers, I love it. He then flexes and says, you guys make me feel like I'm 25 again. Elsewhere in the Resistance's bunker, we learn that Wes Adams actually hates all of that nostalgic Earth shit. He just took a crash course on a whole bunch of Earth pop culture as a way to build trust with Duke. A Resistance member is showing Wes a 1972 Mustang car that he special ordered from Earth. The man thought that Wes might appreciate it due to his supposed interests with Earth. But Wes could care less. Wes, he radios in for Kingfisher's men 
to release the gas. And at that moment, some gas starts being fed into the Resistance's base. Wes, he pops something in his mouth that appears to protect the gas from affecting him. But all the other Resistance members begin to fall asleep. Wes explains it's not fatal. Kingfisher wants everyone alive for a big public execution. What's the point of crushing the Resistance if nobody gets to see it? Kingfisher's soldiers then arrive in the Resistance base. Duke McQueen is the only Resistance member still awake, as he is wearing his helmet, which protects him from the knockout gas. Duke, he starts firing on the various soldiers and kills a few of them, but he is outnumbered and is eventually forced to run away and retreat. Duke, he is running and running, and he eventually jumps off a cliff down into some water below. Wes Adams and some of these soldiers see Duke land in the water below, and they assume that he is as good as dead as the water is populated with sea creatures called cherry bids. And we see that these monsters, these cherry bids, pull Duke further down into the water. Kingfisher's men return with the resistance back to the capital of Tantalus for their upcoming public executions. The resistance members are all marched through the street, their arms tied behind their backs. Kingfisher spots the resistance leader, Tilda Star, walking in the crowd, and he uses his telekinetic gloves, and he lifts Tilda up into the air and over to him. And then when he has Tilda close to him, he tells her, I have to say, I thought you'd be taller. You've caused a lot of problems for such a physically average specimen. I thought you'd like a better view of the security system we're having fitted. We're turning Tantalus into a fortress, just in case any other passing predators come along and take an interest in your riches. Kingfisher also points to several swords he has hanging from the ceiling almost like a messed up kind of decoration. Kingfisher tells her, the swords up there were taken from your comrades. Don't worry, we'll have yours up there soon too. It's a constant display of how easily you fell. Does it hurt being such a failure twice? Tilda spits in Kingfisher's face and Kingfisher orders her to be taken away and she is brought down to the holding cells with the others. Kingfisher then has a video camera start recording him, and he broadcasts this message all across the planet. He tells the people of Tantalus, Tilda Star has been defeated, and her rebel army captured. The resistance is over, along with any notion that our absolute rule is anything but inevitable now. Our new global defense program has just been activated in your skies. Your new working day will now be three hours longer. Only Duke McQueen will be spared tomorrow morning's public executions, and only then because he's dead already. Kingfisher out. Elsewhere, we see Duke McQueen is still in fact alive. He walks out of the sea, having killed those monsters, and he is determined to save the day. Issue 6. The Conclusion The cover shows Duke holding a sword high in the air, surrounded by tons of police officers trying to tackle him down. The variant cover by Cliff Chang shows Duke swinging over a whole bunch of swords, while Krish with a jetpack, is flying behind him, firing on people. The next day, it is time for the public executions to start. Tilda, Krish, and the others are brought out of their cells. Krish tells Pindar, You won't be laughing when Duke comes back? You know he never fails. 
You know he's coming back to blow you all away. Pindar laughs and says, Duke McQueen, you mean that old man? He's dead. The resistance fighters in the castle with no doors are brought in front of a crowd for their public executions in what looks like a gladiator-style stadium. Wes Adams is there, now wearing normal clothes instead of the vintage Earth Fonzie stuff he was wearing earlier. He is looking forward to the resistance fighters' deaths. He announces to the crown that the resistance fighters will be hanged. Hanging is an exotic form of death from the home world of their fallen champion, Duke McQueen. Krish, he is tearing up. But Tilda tells him to be strong and not cry. The people need to know that they shouldn't be afraid. Kingfisher, hearing this, laughs. The civilians of this planet are weak, and they are not fighters, and they fell easily, he says. You jest, of course. These pathetic sheep have spent their entire lives afraid. They dig up their treasures to make us rich and thank us daily for the pleasure of doing so. They exist to be exploited. None will take a stand. We will rule this world for a thousand years because they dare not even raise a voice against us. They are weak, they are cowards, and they are cattle. There is no one left to challenge me now. We see Duke McQueen is not dead. He is driving to the castle with no doors, to that stadium-looking area where the resistance fighters are about to be hung. He is driving that 1972 Mustang car we saw last issue. And Duke has also apparently stolen some sort of device that lets him take over transmissions. He uses it to take over the feed in the stadium where the executions are about to take place. Duke McQueen, talking to the crowd of people in attendance, says, People of Tantalus, get off your knees. This is Duke McQueen, and I need your help. Back me up, and we can beat these guys. Let me down, and they'll kill me in here. I saved you once, now you can save me. Pick up a weapon, and fight your oppressors. The people in the crowd seem moved to action. Maybe they can win this, if they fight. Duke McQueen then makes his entrance into this stadium area in that Mustang vehicle. Kingfisher, seeing Duke's entrance, orders, Bring him in, but don't kill him yet. I want to see him hanging with all the other rebels. Duke exits the car and lights up a cigar. He is ready to fight. Admiral Pindar walks down and confronts Duke. Pindar asks him, Are you really this delusional, Captain? You're old and you're out of shape. You couldn't have beat us even as a young man. What makes you think you can do so now? And Duke answers, Because 40 years ago, these people hadn't heard of me. Now they've seen what I can do. Yeah, they're soft and scared and easily pushed around, but they grew up hearing that I never lose, and you feel a little braver when you're standing beside a legend. Pindar then sees the crowd of civilians inspired by Duke have taken up arms and start storming the grounds below, rushing the stage where the resistance leadership is waiting to be hung. Pindar yells, open fire! Duke punches him. Duke then triggers Pindar's jetpack, and the two of them go flying up into the air. Wes Adams, he has a remote, and he triggers the ground to fall under the Resistance members waiting to be hung. The Resistance members are all now hanging by their necks. Krish yells, Captain! Duke in the air with Pindar on the jetpack replies, relax kid, I got ya! Duke aims his laser gun and fires at the ropes, hanging the resistance leaders, and he manages to free them. Duke, he then rides Pindar on the jetpack up above to where Kingfisher and his royalty is sitting. Down below, Tilda Star, now free, 
she grabs a rifle and she aims it up into the air and she shoots Wes Adams who was attempting to flee. He was flying in the air on some sort of vehicle. Well, she shoots Wes Adams and Wes falls out of the vehicle he was in high in the air and he falls down to his death. Duke. He fights his way through some of the opposition up above near where all the royalty is. He eventually finds himself face to face with the Kingfisher. The two of them fight a little bit, but Kingfisher has those telekinetic gloves and Duke can't even get close to him as Kingfisher is pushing Duke back and deflecting any shots Duke is firing from his pistol. Kingfisher with those gloves starts crushing Duke's heart with them. Duke, he starts shooting up at the ceiling though, many times over and over again. Kingfisher is confused. He asks Duke, I'm over here you old fool, are you blind as well as senile? And Duke answers, nope, just weaken in the ceiling. Duke and the Kingfisher are in that weird room that Kingfisher was showing Tilda Star earlier. The one with all of the swords of the resistance hanging from the ceiling as decorations. So Duke, he was firing at the ceiling to weaken it and eventually the ceiling collapses down on Kingfisher. Kingfisher, he uses his telekinetic gloves to stop the ceiling from crushing him and he gloats to Duke and calls him an idiot and he says that he'll snap Duke in two and curl him into a ball. But Duke smiles and says, yeah, but can you do both at the same time? Duke shoots at Kingfisher and manages to kill him. Kingfisher, he had too much stuff he had to control. He had to keep Duke subdued. He had to stop the ceiling from collapsing. It was too much. That is why Duke was able to hit him. And with Kingfisher now down, the ceiling then collapses on top of him as well, ensuring his death. Duke, he feels like he has won, but then Admiral Pindar sneaks up and is going to shoot Duke. Pindar aims his gun and is about to fire, but Duke is saved at the last moment by Krish, who arrived and shot Pindar himself in the stomach. All that training Duke gave Krish has paid off. Pindar is now bleeding out, his stomach seemingly falling out of his belly. And he says to Krish, look at me, look what you have done. What am I supposed to do now? Krish, getting his revenge, throws some coins on the ground in front of Pindar and tells him to learn how to bank. Pindar, who couldn't figure out exactly where he saw the boy before, finally remembers who Krish is, and he says, oh no, and Krish shoots and kills him, getting his revenge. The Brotian army of the Kingfisher arrives in the sky with all of their spaceships, and over a loudspeaker they warn, attention people of Tantalus, Lay down your weapons or be vaporized where you stand. Submit to Brotia or prepare to die. There will be no further warnings. Luckily though, Tilda Star, when she got free, she led a team of resistance fighters to a control room that controls the planet's newly built defense systems. She triggers the defense systems on and they start shooting all the Brotian spaceships out of the sky. And eventually, their planet is saved and free from the oppressive rule of the Brotians and Kingfisher and his various minions. The next day, the planet is celebrating. Tilda gives Duke another medal for saving their planet once again. A man asks Duke if he wants to stay and be their king. Duke answers, sorry bud, not my style. Besides, you don't need a king when you've got a perfectly good queen right here. Duke says this referring to Tilda. Duke talking about Tilda says, there's nobody braver or done more for her people. I think Atala would be honored to have Tilda as her successor. Tilda thanks Duke. 
Duke starts heading to a spaceship to go back home. One of the men asks Duke, do you really need to go? And Duke answers, yeah, I got kids, remember? They might be big and not need me anymore, but I sure as hell need to see them every once in a while. The man shakes Duke's hand and thanks him for giving him their strength back. Duke, he gets on the spaceship and before he leaves, he waves by to the crowd and he says, So long, Tantalus! Try not to get enslaved again! I don't think my joints could take it. Krish and Duke leave planet Tantalus. Krish is flying Duke back home. When they arrive back on Earth, Krish is going to drop Duke off. But before he does, he wants to make sure Earth knows this time that Duke's story was real, especially Duke's family. Krish phones Duke's son Larry and tells him to look out the window of his office. Krish then flies the spaceship outside Larry's office and Larry sees his dad flying from the spaceship and waving at him. Then they fly by Duke's other son Ralph's house. Ralph's outside with his family having a barbecue and Duke is there in that spaceship above the ground waving at his son. And Ralph is surprised as is Duke's granddaughter. Chris, she then flies Duke to the White House lawn and sets the spaceship down. So now clearly the whole world will know. Duke tells Chris, you have no idea how much trouble you just got us in, kid. And Chris replies, you rescued an entire world, sir. It's only right people know about it. Chris then salutes Duke and tells him it's been an honor. And Duke replies, it sure has. But this isn't the way we say goodbye to our friends around these parts. Give me a hug. The two of them hug and Duke tells Krish, You look after yourself up there, space boy. And Krish, he begins tearing up a bit and he says, Are you kidding? I'm Duke McQueen's pal. Who the hell is going to mess with me? One year later, on the next anniversary of his wife's death, the entire family showed up this time to celebrate properly, and they have all started seeing each other a lot more regularly. And Duke, he feels good that his family finally believe his incredible stories of adventure and no longer think he's a nut. Duke, he is smiling and he's happy. One of Duke's kids asks him, why are you smiling so much? And Duke, he tips his beer and says, I'm just thinking how much your mother would have loved all of this. Duke, he then excuses himself to step outside and smoke a cigarette, and he stares up into the night sky at the stars. He remembers his wife, Joanne, and he kisses the sky and says, I love you, my darling. Thanks for everything. And we see the sign for the town where Duke lives now reads... Welcome to Little Hampton, home of Duke McQueen. So clearly he is now a hero on Earth too, as well. And that is the end of Starlight. So that was Starlight, and I loved this book. I thought the artwork was great. I love the concept of this Duke McQueen this space traveler saved the day. No one believed him. Came back home. Now he's an old man. His wife and his dad. His kids don't want much to do with him. And he's kind of lonely. We see him at his lowest. And we see how the world has kind of looked at him as this fool. This guy that's making up stories. And he finally gets that redemption arc. And someone asks him to go back to this planet. And he saves the day once again as this old man. And it's a story you can really get behind. And when we get the planet Tantalus, I like how fantastical the planet is. I like the bad guys, how they've taken over this planet and have uh, subjected the people to this tyranny. And Duke has to save the day once again. I like Krish. I like the supporting cast. Uh, very, very fun stuff. I liked some of the action set pieces near the end in that uh, gladiator style kind of stadium. That was really cool. As I'm reading the comic, I'm just envisioning how the movie would adapt this 
And I keep thinking how cool it would be. So I love so much of this story and I love the ending, the very kind of sentimental ending when Duke goes back home and he loves his family once again. And then he's staring into the night sky and remembers his past uh, wife. So a uh, great ending as well. Now my negatives are that every Mark Miller comic kind of is written like a movie pitch. He just writes these kind of short stories, five, six, seven issues, and then he's done. And then he tries to uh, sell it to a movie studio and tries to get it made into something. And sometimes he doesn't flesh out to the characters in the world as much as I would like. I would love if Starlight was maybe 10 or 12 issues and we really kind of expanded on some of this stuff. But nevertheless, I still think Starlight was pretty well written and very compelling. And I'm going to give it an 8.5 out of 10. Really dug it. Thank you all for watching. And I'll be back next week with Prodigy by Mark Miller. So be sure to tune in for that. Thank <laughs> you.